welcome to SpecklePod, the only podcast focused on breaking free in the AC industry through ingenious solutions executed by some very bold individuals. Expect a series of interviews with AEC leaders and innovators where we shed light on their achievements and challenges as they navigate the industry. In this episode, we speak to Emma Hooper, Head of Information Management Strategy at RLB Digital. Her work largely focuses on defining the bigger picture with regards to information management across the whole asset lifecycle. This involves joining up information management activities with the way information is structured and connected, utilizing open standards. So Emma, I'm very happy to have you on SpeckleCard. How are you? I'm great. And thank you for asking me to join you today. Thank you. Uh, as I said, I have two very snappy icebreaking questions for you before we jump into the heart of the conversation. The first one is, how would you describe your role as information management in three words? Oh, three words. Um... Spinning lots of plates. <laughs> so that's probably more than three. <laughs> I like that. We'll, we'll, we'll dig deeper then, but this is a good start. <laughs> and what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear AEC? Oh, information. Okay. We're setting the tone for this conversation, so let's go. Um, Emma, I've already introduced you, but I'd love to hear from you. Obviously, um, you're head of information management at RLB Digital. Do you want to tell us more about your journey to get to this role and also what the role implies? Um, I started out quite a while ago now um, at university doing architecture, like a lot of people in space, and realized after my part one, I, I didn't really want to do building design, um, which is a problem when you are not want to be an architect. Um, but what I really did love was um, producing information and drafting. And that's really why I, I wanted to be an architect. It was all about technical drawing. Um, and in fact, I, I didn't even like computers. So that's the irony in this. Um, but um, I then decided, well, I, I do actually need to learn CAD if I'm ever going to do anything in terms of, of drafting. So I saved up for an AutoCAD course and absolutely really loved um, you know, CAD basically and found my niche there. So I ended up becoming um, an architectural technician, first in retail fit out where I was not only doing AutoCAD, but I was also introduced to MicroStation. So um, I was kind of helping to lead on those two fronts, um, but I came bored, really wanted to get into 3D. Um, started looking at three things like 3D Studio Max at the time, but then I was introduced to this new tool called Revit back in sort of start of 2009. And um, yeah, um, after seeing Revit for the first time, I was absolutely hooked. Um, so I, I taught myself it um, and everything kind of my life revolved around it at that time. Um, and um, it was initially for sort of 3D visualization, but I started to get really heavily involved in the sort of the the parametric side of it and the maths and, and I loved all that side um, and um, then I um, got a role as um, an architectural technician and architects it was only a very small practice um, I was the only technician so um, they wanted to start you know starting to get into this, um, this bin malarkey and so um, I was really kind of in charge of the whole Revit um, set up all the production of information all the modeling all the drawings so I got to see um, really the whole process um, in terms of producing information in a, in a sort of a, a BIM environment. And um, luckily as well, even though it was a very small architectural practice, um, they were actually um, heavily involved in looking at IFC for content creation. So they were actually creating um, content for models actually from data. So this was so far ahead of its time. It was unreal back in 2012. But that's where I was first exposed to to things like IFC. Um, from that, I started to see actually models. It wasn't necessarily about what they looked like anymore. It was the underlying data. And that's where the power was. And if we could start to automate and, and connect the dots between that, then actually, as I was modeling, it became so much easier. And, and by the end of it, it became that I was not really bothered about really what the model looked like. It was actually how I'd structured all the data in the background and even down to how I'd configured everything. Um, and I spent a lot of time really looking at the whole IFC workflow in Revit and 
created a method to actually then actually export IFC in a quality way that you could get copy out of it. At the same time, I was also um, launched into order of information management. Um, I was had my first sort of information management role on um, the world's first IPI project, which was integrated project insurance. And so I was one of the information managers from the start of the project all the way through. And being the um, technician as well, I was not only producing information, but also managing it. So I really got to see just how all that information flowed. And I then decided to leave, you know, architecture and design behind. You know, information was my passion. That's what I wanted to do. And so um, I moved into information management. um, And that's where I've been ever since. Now I've moved from projects more into a strategic role um, at RLB Digital. As, As you said, I'm head of information management strategy. Um, so um, my role really is, I suppose, look, it's this kind of two parts to it in a way. It's about really looking um, at the this um, sort of consultancy side, um, but also thinking about looking at uh, concepts around information and um, how information should be applied in the built environment and mentioned about the bigger picture. So I, I love problem solving and joining things up and there's no greater problem to solve in this industry than joining up information how it should really flow so I've, I'm heavily involved in looking at how all the standards connect together um, from you know the atomic detail of schemas and taxonomies you know all the way then up into the real world of how that's applied um, on a project or within even within an organization yes projects have been my kind of um focus in the past but yeah one of the things I really want to focus more on is the organizational side because for me information management we need to focus on organizations first get that in order first before projects because there's no point in getting data and information from projects if it can't be used within an organization so for me information management starts in an organization and we need to kind of think about that more as an industry. I'm also um, vice chair of NEMA and Building Smart UK and Ireland. And um, I'm also part of, you know, um, British Standards Institute, the committee that actually looks after the information management standards. And um, I'm also um, a fellow at the University of Nottingham in information management and modelling. To summarise what I'm really doing, it, it's really looking at likes of ISO 19650, but with the context of information and data modeling. So to try and really move us into a more sort of data-driven approach. Wow, I mean, your experience is very impressive and thank you so much for kind of touching on all the milestones um, in in your career path and how you got to the role today. And I think, again, you're the best person to ask my next question, which is all about the state of the industry. And you already kind of hinted to uh, your opinion on where AEC is going and and how it's looking, especially from a, a data and information perspective. So in terms of that, um, what do you think is the current state of the AEC industry after years of exchanging proprietary files? Um, well, if I could sum it up, it's probably um, just a tangled web of chaos. <laughs> it's how I see it. Um, you know, I, I tend to see things as information flows and, and it's just this absolute tangled web um, for what I you know, what I see. Um, but I think it's quite important to define what I mean by proprietary because I think some people have different um, definitions of it. So so when I'm talking about proprietary, I'm really talking about, you know, data structures um, and formats that are more sort of specific to a use of software or an organisation. So they're very narrow and therefore it's very difficult to share data between them or merge it or link it. Um, so, yeah, we, we tend to always think about proprietary file formats and software, but it does go a little bit further than that as well in terms of data structures. And one of the reasons why we have this chaos is because generally over the past, you know, probably 30 years is that we tend to be led by technology when it comes to information rather than actually seeing information as a separate entity from technology. We see it all the time when in information management that, you know, people tend to define information around the the words used by certain software and and they organize it by certain software. But that's fine in the software's environment because it's specifically 
you know, structured for that. But if you take it outside of that, then we start to have problems. And that's, you know, why, again, we have a lot of this tangled state that we're in. For me, it's very important to think of information independent of technology. In regards to sort of the whole proprietary file sharing scenario, back when I was a technician, I was always like very proud that I was the tech architectural technician and therefore everyone was using my information for their own information because it's the base information. Therefore, I had a real responsibility to make sure my information could be shared in every way possible so everyone could do their work as I would hold them up. So I always remember you know, every Friday night, you know, being in the office till eight, nine o'clock at night because I was going through every single file format under the sun, having to export it for everybody. Because, you know, whether it was a, a, an, an NWC, a, you know, um, a DWG, a DXF, you know, it was endless. Um, and, you know, I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. You know, we can't be doing this. Um, and so that, that was another reason why I started to think, is there a better way to, to actually start to share our information? And actually, a large part of my career has actually been based upon getting data out of one software and into another. And, and I always joke that actually, if the software and data side worked, I wouldn't actually be here right now, to be honest. So, you know, rather than me learning about you know, construction detailing and, and what I was meant to learn about, my path was very much about, you know, looking at um, how data could transfer into one software and into another. None of that's sustainable. And yeah, I, I would do it because I put the hours in um, up and above what I was working, but most normal people don't do that and they didn't have to. Yeah, for me, that way of working, like I said, it is, it's just not sustainable and we need to rethink how we're going to be sharing data and especially for the future as well, because we're going to be moving away from, you know, how we work at the moment with big files and, and everything into a more data model centric approach. If you've got many variations of data models or slightly different data structures, that blows my mind because the combinations of, of alignment and mapping between them, it, it's, it just won't happen. So we've almost got to think, right, how, how do we deal with that? And so it sounds like you already have been exploring different alternatives or ways to shift away from that format, which you're describing as pretty frustrating, um, to other ways or other solutions. So tell us more about your workarounds or the alternatives that you found that go against proprietary files. And so I was doing all that work, you know, I thought, you know, is there, is there one sort of um, way, one structure that, that could act as a base basically um, that we could all work off and you know I've mentioned about putting information first and looking at it independently of technology that's you know the root that, that's one of my kind of statements that I always think about all the time and work towards so um, for me it's really actually how to detach, detach information from technology look at it open it up make it neutral and accessible and that for me forms um, like what I call the data sort of foundations. So we, we need to be kind of working towards a, a common information or data a framework. So, so that any tool, no matter what software you're using, can plug in. So in a way, we're flipping it on its head. So it's not information doesn't serve technology. Technology serves information. Information, we put it first. Form those foundations um, and... If anything, we're then meeting all the processes, all the ways of working, the technology, we're meeting it halfway. And really, you know, it's all about open standards and um, those sort of more open ways of working. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of that in a sort of concept type. So let's talk about um, open workflows. And I think this is very important also in, in the heart of this podcast, the main goal of this podcast is to, sh is to shed light on those ways we're breaking free in AEC and by that we're moving from closed workflows to open workflows. So I'm sure you have your own definition of what that means and also I'm sure you have an opinion on whether it's a, a good or bad thing to use them in the industry. So can you tell us more about that? It's really about creating data structures that anything can plug into. So that, that's what it really means. And um, you know, say so that you can not only use the best tool for what you want to do so you shouldn't be told to use a certain software 
Um, and I've seen that many a times, even when it's the software isn't even applicable to what the person wants to do. Um, and that's wrong. Yeah. I shouldn't be doing that. Um, but it's also, um, we need to have commonality. So with my information management hat on, we, we need commonality through how we define what things are called, how we define what metadata is attached to objects, for instance. Um, and we need, that's also a really important part um, in terms of being open. So we can carry that sort of thread of information all the way through the information management process. So as an example, say like programs, say you've got procurement programs, construction programs, design programs, information programs. What we see at the moment is they're all structured in different ways. Um, whether that's because of the software that they're being used or because someone's created a bespoke structure. But if we were then to try and um, merge those, we can't do it because they're completely different. Or we were trying to link them, we can't do it. So there's a whole load of insight there that we can't actually gain from projects or from our assets because the data structures are all completely different. That's really what Open is all about. It's having that standardized foundational core that we all work towards so that we can start to share our data. Um, whether it's between software, um, but also between, you know, the, the sort of process of information management as well. I really like what you said about uh, having technology serve information. And I think that's key to also what you're saying now. And so one question I really wanted to ask you is looking back through all the your achievements and everything that you've you've done and worked on in the industry, what are you most proud of today? I, th I think the whole IFC and Revit workflow, because that was so difficult to solve and it took me so long. Um, but um, because I've generally helped a lot of people, um, you know, who use Revit. And uh, I, even now I still get messages saying thank you for for those, for that, that blog that I did. Um, and, you know, that, that was really nice to hear that I've helped people. Um, so, yeah, I think that was probably one of the, the number one things. But also really trying to simplify this and educate people in my presentations and um, with regards to what we're trying to do because there's so much misinformation and misunderstanding out there when it comes to information you know i, I see what think people are doing and, and i notice something in there that maybe i triggered something somewhere and that may resulted in a really good you know product or some or sort of workflow or something I'll make sure to link to the blog in the episode description. <laughs> it sounds like, uh, you know, it did make a change in, in the industry. And again, talking of, uh, speaking of the industry in AEC, uh, one question we ask on the podcast to all of our guests is, what is the elephant in the AEC room, in your opinion? Um, so this is probably completely different to what I've been talking about, but um, for me, it is insurance. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, um, because it controls so much of the industry and it creates our behaviors, it makes us adversarial, it stops innovation, it controls procurement, and it actually stops information, therefore stops information flowing as it needs to. Um, and if we could somehow, if anybody is listening who's into insurance and, and you know, start to change that I'm all ears and I'd be very happy to talk to them because for me this is why the industry is in such a mess not just in terms of information but yeah generally speaking so yeah insurance procurement business models that's definitely for me the big okay. category. your message is out there and maybe someone will reach out after listening to this <laughs> and uh lastly Emma the the final question to wrap up what does breaking free in AEC mean to you and how should we achieve it in your opinion? It's really about that working towards that one common data framework. So, you know, that's kind of the science side of the industry in terms of information. And that's across, you know, all trigger events, organizations, projects, use cases. It doesn't really matter who you are. You're kind of involved in this. Um, and really, as an industry, thinking ourselves as one organization and that when it comes to information, we are all united. Therefore, we do actually have to work together and invest as well, you know, in those foundations. And for me, like the likes of Building Smart, obviously I'm, I'm Vice Chairman of Smart Can Island, you know, that's what Building Smart is there for, to help create those foundations in that that information layer. Um, no, and, and we need people to get behind standards like IFC, for instance. You know, that is 
the foundational data model standard that we have in the industry. Um, and I think if we could work together to make that really good, and I think we might actually have a chance of of actually making all this work, especially with what's going to happen in the future. Emma, thank you so, so much. Uh, this was a very insightful conversation and I can't wait to share it. <laughs>